many bizarre and strange stories have come from North Korea. Starting when Kim Il-sung was installed as the chairman of the North Korean branch of the Korean Communist Party in 1945. One of the more truly strange stories is of the abduction of Shin Sang Ok and Choi In Hee, whom were taken against their will to the Hermit Kingdom and forced to create movies for the then head of the motion picture and arts division of North Korea's propaganda and agitation department, King John Il. And somehow this bizarre story led to a very entertaining film showing an allegory for capitalism's greed in the shape of a Godzilla ripoff. Capitalism. A copy of which is in my DVD collection. Now like all stories, let's start at the best place, the beginning. But I'm assuming that you all have a rough outline of the North-South divide in Korea, cemented by the 1950 Korean War. In 1966, King John Il, firstborn son of King Il Sun, started working on propaganda films in the agitation department. Kim had developed an interest in movies during his education and trips abroad, eventually amassing a collection of 15,000 motion pictures from around the world to take inspiration from. Many of Kim's early works were pretty derivative of the whole forced anti-West propaganda genre, mainly focusing on the pride of the nation and further helping to develop the personality cult of Kim Il-sung. However, in the early 1970s, being the cinephile he was, King John Il felt unhappy with the quality of the films he produced. In comparison with the West, as many North Korean films came across wooden and boring. This was due to a lack of interest in the cast and crews involved. Even though Kim John Il brought new subjects to Korean cinema, most notably subject matter based around the 1930s guerrilla activities of King Il-sung in Manchuria, the lethargy of his crews was a result of being fed and paid regardless of the results yielded, because of world communism. This led many people involved in the movie industry to give minimum effort performances. John Eel would be heard on the subject in a 1983 tape recording, bizarrely kind of praising capitalism. When I watch our films, they are all dogmatic. Why do our films always have the same ideological stories? Why are there so many crying scenes? Frankly speaking, the reason is that in the South, they work hard because they need to make money and feed themselves. It's a result of blood, sweat and tears. But here, people are simply happy and comfortable. No one whips them onwards. Kim decided that he needed to reinvigorate the North Korean film industry by injecting some new blood and passion into his productions. So like all heir apparents working under a complete dictatorship, Kim decided the best course of action was to do a little bit of kidnapping. But who to kidnap? Shin San Ok, born Shin Tae Seo, on the 11th of October 1926 in Saishin, Japanese Korea. This area would eventually become part of North Korea. Shin built up a career in Korean cinema, starting off as an assistant production designer in Korea's first film after independence from Japan, named quite fittingly Viva Freedom. In the coming decades, Shin gained notoriety during the golden age of Korean cinema for being a prolific and successful director. In 1954, Shin married actress Cho Hin Hee and the couple created the Shin Production Company and produced nearly 300 films in the 1960s alone. During this period, Shin won several Korean film awards. This earned him the nickname The Prince of South Korean Cinema. Cho Hin Hee was born in Gwangju in 1926. After her marriage to Shin, she acted in around 125 films and was viewed as one of the most successful and loved actors in South Korea during the 1960s. The good times looked like they would never stop, however as the 1970s rolled in, the Korean government encroached on the film industry by creating heavy-handed censorship. During this period, Shin's activity decreased and the films he did make flopped at the box office. General Puck Chung-hee closed down Shin's film studio after becoming a target from the oppressive South Korean government. I've mentioned Cheng Hee before, check out this video. In 1976, Choi and Shin got divorced after Shin had fathered two children with another woman. Even though they had ended their relationship, the couple kept in contact. Both their careers had been on a course for the rocks since the start of the 1970s. It was due to this that in 1978, Choi went to Hong Kong for a business meeting with a mysterious person wanting her to direct a movie. This business meeting would end up changing both Choi and Shin's lives forever. 
On the 22nd of January, Choi set foot against her will in Nampo Bay, South Pyongyang Province, North Korea. During her abduction, Choi had been drugged and bundled aboard a speedboat in Repulse Bay, Hong Kong. She was given the grand tour of Pyongyang's museums and landmarks, as well as a visit to Kim Il-sung's birthplace. Choi was housed in a luxury villa and was assigned a teacher to learn about the life of Kim Il-sung. After being introduced, King Jong-il showed Choi the nation's best movies and operas and invited her to give her opinion. However, she wasn't abducted just to give advice on the entertainment industry of the DPRK. Instead, she was taken as bait for her ex-husband. By 1978, Shin had a new family and had been travelling the world looking for film work to claim a visa outside of the now oppressive situation for him in South Korea. Six months after Choi's capture, Shin had travelled to Hong Kong in search for his ex-wife. It was then too that Shin found himself kidnapped. Shin would later say on his capture, Someone suddenly pulled a sack over my head and I couldn't see anything or breathe properly. Shin received the same welcome as Choi with the usual tour of Pyongyang and education on the North Korean state. Shin tried to escape a number of times, resulting in several years of jail for disobedience. During this time, he was none the wiser of why he had been abducted. After his stint in prison, Shin received re-education. In 1983, Shin was deemed re-educated enough and invited to a dinner party to find out why he had been abducted, hosted by King John il Choi had been brought to the party as well and the two met for the first time since their abductions and they learnt why they were there. In the same year, the couple remarried under the suggestion of Kim. Shin and Choi were shown a vast library of films amassed by Kim. Many copies of both Western and Eastern bloc blockbusters secured by North Korean diplomats posted abroad. They were set a target to watch four films a day to take inspiration. From this, Kim revealed that he wanted the couple to produce a film to submit to international film festivals, and Shin was given an office in chosen film studios Pyongyang. Shin would later say at age 77, I hated communism, but I pretended to be devoted to it to escape from this barren republic. It was lunacy. You see, King John Il was aware of the lack of interest North Korean films garnered abroad, as every movie produced in the country had a very thinly veiled propaganda message. As well, being told about the evil of the West and the greatness of a country you can't even visit doesn't sound like the most exciting of plot devices. Because of this, Shin was given a broader scope for subjects to cover in order to make a movie more universal. However, there would still have to be an element of propaganda. In 1983, Shin proposed adapting one of Kim Il-sung's plays, allegedly written during his time as a guerrilla fighter. The story was based around the Hague secret embassy affair in 1907. He chose this subject for two reasons. The first being that adapting one of Kim Il-sung's plays was a safe bet to not make anything offensive. And the second being that the play was set in the Hague. Shin pushed for the production to take place on set in the West, as it would give him an opportunity to escape. King John Il agreed to the subject matter as he wanted to incorporate international settings to widen the appeal of North Korean movies, but he disagreed to having the production take place in the West. Instead, Kim allowed Shin to pick anywhere to make his movies as long as it was inside the Eastern Bloc. After the film was greenlit, a release date was set on the 15th of April 1984, Kim Il-sung's birthday. The movie would be called An Emissary of No Return. The film was shown at the London Film Festival, Shin and Choi were in attendance but any chance of escape never materialised due to a number of North Korean minders. Shin directed a number of other films over a three year period. After an emissary of no return, Shin made Love Love My Love, a musical based on the tale of Cheung Yang. He then made Runaway starring Choi set in 1920s Kandu which featured the destruction of a real full-size train. Apparently, King John Il didn't even flinch when requested that a real train be derailed. Next, he made Salt, also starring Choi. This one would have a more universal appeal and receive very favourable reviews. The story opened with a North Korean first, a quote oddly from the Bible. The film featured Choi as an unnamed mother set during the 1930s, and like Runaway, is also set in Kandu. The movie depicts some truly moving and sad scenes, many of which had never been shown before in North Korea. The film garnered Choi a Best Actress Award at the 14th Moscow Film Festival for her moving performance showing a realistic depiction of suffering during that period of history. 
the award was the highest achievement of a North Korean film to date. Then came The Tale of Xing Chong, another musical based on the tale of the Fifth Ill Pity. Finally came The Pierce to Resistance, the, in my opinion, greatest film ever made by North Korea, Pogasari. Set during the Goryeo Dynasty, Pogasari is based on a legendary creature of the same name. The plot runs loosely like this, I would say there are spoilers but knowing the plot doesn't really affect the value of watching it. An evil king hears of a planned uprising and in response confiscates all the metal pots and pans and farming tools. As a result the masses start to starve, not being able to farm the land and cook food. A blacksmith who is sent to prison makes a little monster statue out of rice. He prays to the gods to bring the statue to life to save his people. The figure comes into contact with the blood of the blacksmith's daughter after accidentally pricking herself with a pin while repairing some clothes. The figure comes to life and the daughter names it Pogasari and it becomes a metal eating creature gradually getting bigger and bigger. Eventually he gets massive and kills the king and frees the people. However now his purpose is complete, he becomes a bit of a nuisance to the people by eating all the metal and demanding more. The daughter tricks Pogasari into eating her, turning him into a stone statue. You could take a couple of readings from the plot. Personally, I like the reading that Polgasari is the North Korean regime, but I find it unlikely that was the intention. Instead, Polgasari is meant to mean how capitalism saves but then takes over. Bizarrely, even though this film was a Godzilla clone, it actually had Toho Studios involved with the special effects. The guy in the Polgasari suit is the same guy in the Godzilla suit from 1971 to 1995. So you could almost say that the film is like an authorised Godzilla clone. There is another film possibly made by Shin during his North Korean years called Hong Kil Dong, which has one of the best descriptions for a film on IMDb, and I quote, The illegitimate son of a nobleman defends peasants from greedy rulers, confounds local bandits, struggles for permission to marry his tasty upper crust sweetheart despite their vast societal differences. Then ninjas arrive. If that doesn't make you want to watch it, then I don't know what would. I'd say that out of the films made by Shin and Choi during their captivity, Polgasari and Salt are a must see. The couple by the time of Polgasari's release had gained the trust of Kim Jong Il and had secured a trip to Vienna to scout for filming locations for a new movie. Whilst on their trip, the couple managed to evade their North Korean chaperones and seek asylum in the US Embassy on the 13th of March 1986. Two months went by before the couple held a press conference in the Watergate Hotel on the 15th of May 1986. North Korea claimed that the couple had escaped the country after stealing money and said that the couple had freely defected to the North. This was supported by a press conference in 1984 made by the couple while in Belgrade, Yugoslavia, where they had said that they had gone to the North willingly. However, this was blown out of the water by the couple themselves as they had a tape recording of a number of conversations with Kim Jong-il as an insurance policy. In the recorded conversations, Kim openly spoke about his intentions to kidnap the couple. Shin and Choi lived in the US until the mid-1990s when they moved back to South Korea. Shin died in 2006 at the age of 79 and Choi died this year at the age of 91. It's arguable that this is one of the more oddest stories to come from North Korea. However, the couple weren't the only people abducted by the regime. Many Japanese and South Koreans found themselves taken against their will, but that might be a story for another video. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video. A very special thank you to my patrons. Like what you saw? Help the channel grow by liking, commenting and subscribing and following me on Twitter. To keep updated with all new videos, hit the bell icon. And if you'd like to support the channel on Patreon, there's a link in the description. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching.